In feudal Japan, it was believed the territorial boundaries were marked out by spirits. The spirits were called up by the sound of the war drum, the kodo. The further the sound traveled, the further the landowner's power was extended. In those days, Japan was torn apart by incessant wars provoked by wealthy landowners and fought by warrior retainers of noble birth. They were known as the samurai. Today, annual rallies are held around Japan in their honor. The descendants of these devoted warriors and others who share their passion come together, as here in Soma, to ensure that the samurai spirit will live on. They meet in the name of Bushido, meaning the way of the warrior. This is a rigid code of behavior that was observed by these armed retainers throughout feudal Japan. Similar to the codes of chivalry in medieval Europe, Bushido was based on wisdom, compassion, courage, and above all, total loyalty to the feudal baron to whom the samurai devoted his life. The code was designed to control the conduct of the warriors on the battlefield through disciplined self-control. By observing these rules, the samurai dignity was maintained. According to the historian, Professor Koei Irie of Tsukuba University, the Japanese are still extremely attached to this culture, continually developed by the samurai until the 19th century. Bushido is the ancient cult of honor, truth, and virtue. It's quite evident that the spirit of Bushido is still deeply embedded in the heart of every Japanese male. In modern day Japan, the samurai code of honor is admired and highly respected by almost everyone. The warriors were primarily members of the military class, with no other culture but that of weapons. They realized that to maintain their power, they needed much more than just an understanding of weapons. Their discipline was lacking a broad cultural base. It was for this reason that they decided to add an intellectual and spiritual dimension to the art of combat. They began to actively seek knowledge and set about acquiring a generalized culture based on literature, art, and religion. From the 12th to the 19th century, Japan was divided between a handful of feudal barons, the daimyo, under whose orders the samurai served. In 1192, one of these barons monopolized effective power and installed himself as the ruling military dictator, known as the shogun. He succeeded in unifying Japan and established the government seat in Kamakura. The shogun tradition dates from this period and the military government known as Bafuku remained in power until the resignation of the 15th and last shogun in 1867. Thus the influence of the samurai prevailed for close to 700 years.
The final great battle was fought in Sharashino, where guns were used for the first time. This battle has frequently been reconstructed for cinema. Sharashino marked the onset of an irreversible change. Following several centuries of isolation, Japan was obliged to open itself out to the external world. During the peaceful Edo period, this inevitable development precipitated the decline of the warring feudal class. Many Japanese films have recreated the epic samurai battles. Even before World War II, the cinematic genre known as Jidai Geki, the collective term for historical films on this theme, made a fundamental contribution to Japanese cinema and has been a central element of commercial production. Audiences always give an enthusiastic reception to these highly popular films known as shanbara, or sword fight movies. The actors emulate the gestures made by the samurai when preparing for combat, such as the application of makeup and the styling of the shinyon, or shonmagi, symbol of the warrior's honor. These preparations ensured that they looked their impressionable best when facing the enemy. There are a host of films in which the actors excel themselves in highly spectacular battle scenes. Almost every Japanese film director, known or unknown, has at one time furbished arms for the Jidai Geki. It could be said that this genre is to Japanese cinema what the Western movie is to Hollywood. It's through one of these films, Akira Kurosawa's The Seven Samurai, that Western audiences discovered Japanese cinema. In each of his films, Kurosawa idealizes the art of combat and pays homage to the samurai's self-control, his sense of strategy, and his control over his opponent's mind. These are shots from a film called Harakiri, which well demonstrates the violence of these warriors. This masterpiece of cinema was directed by Masaki Kobayashi. This sequence amply shows what a duel between two samurai was like. The samurai dressed in black is an experienced warrior, whereas his opponent in white is a novice. There's no doubt about the realism of this combat. It's quite obvious that both swords are really heavy and that they are using genuine katana. The katana is extremely difficult to handle, and whether attacking or defending, the swordsman needs to use every muscle in his body to control it. The secret is to be able to ward off the opponent's attack by using physical and, much more importantly, spiritual strength. Frontal blows must be avoided at all cost, as the impact could shatter the blade of the katana. The samurai in black, the more experienced of the two, is well aware of this.
We are in Seki, a swordsmith's village that goes back to the Kamakura period, named after the city in which the first shoguns established themselves. This is where generations of skilled workers have fashioned some of Japan's finest blades, particularly the katana, the sword used by the samurai, symbol of his power and spirit. The making of the katana is an art in itself, nothing short of a sacred ritual that can be practiced only in a temple. In Seki, this ritual is reserved for an elite of which Katsuo Kato is a member. In the workshop, only this man knows the secrets involved in the making of a katana. As is true for the other master swordsmiths of Seki, it was his ancestors who passed down the required knowledge. He is assisted by three hand-picked apprentices. The basic material of the katana is this powdered iron. It is very carefully and slowly poured into the hot furnace using a kind of square-shaped funnel. It melts and forms an amalgam that we call kira. From the block that has formed, we extract the tamahagani. This is the raw material for the sword. The tamahagani is then melted down and during the process takes on a charge of carbon monoxide. The amount of carbon is paramount as we use the part that contains the greatest quantity as the hard material. The process is lengthy and meticulous. The smithy begins by flattening out the metal. He repeatedly heats it up and hardens it in water until he obtains the various sections. The pieces are then sorted according to their carbon content, a measure of their quality. They are reheated, drawn out, and then they are sectioned and beaten together. The entire operation is repeated again and again up to 15 times. We eventually produce an iron block, which is made up of several parts. There is an intermediary layer and a layer on each side. Each piece has a different degree of hardness. We use the hardened part of the intermediary layer to fashion the sword's cutting edge. Every part of the block is put to use. It is heated and then beaten out to increase its length. And this is what we finally obtain. The number of swords Katsuo Kato produces with the help of his apprentices is limited. In any one year, his workshop produces only 24 katana. It takes him 20 days to forge a single weapon. In Japan, the katana is still considered sacred. I am descended from a family of swordsmiths. I represent the 25th generation since the age of Muramashi. We light the fire in the furnace. We don't actually measure the temperature. We know exactly when to beat the metal by observing the flame. The flames are as they were in the olden days. It's as if the fire is perpetuating knowledge. For us, the flames are sacred and represent the passing on of a tradition. The katana produced by the Seki forges are considered as precious objects and are snapped up by collectors. They were cult objects, the symbols of the samurai's courage and loyalty. The warrior who lost his sword, whose blade was shattered, also lost his honor. Oh. 
During the 700 years of the Shogun, in Kamakura and Kyoto, the feudal barons, the daimyo, were obliged to report at regular intervals to the Shogun. This was one of the ways in which the ruler could maintain his hold over them. During their travels, they would often pass the night in the home of a baron friend, or more frequently, at an inn. The village of Nakasendo was located on one of the main routes to the shogun's court. Its 42 inns have been carefully preserved as historic sites. In feudal times, they were often the scenes of intense activity, where during their stopovers, the visitors would barter goods and exchange news and information. Hiroshi Ogasarawa, a professor of medieval history and an expert on this period, invites us to follow him into one of the inns, which in former times were strictly reserved for the daimyo and his samurai. According to the size of his fief, the daimyo was accompanied by an escort. This escort could include up to 30 or 40 people, sometimes even more. When the caravan arrived, the villagers would come out to meet it and help carry the baggage and tie up the horses. This inn was known as a honjin. The barons would come here to spend the night, enjoying feasts served by the villagers. Many women were employed here to serve the travelers. The Hanjin was strictly reserved for the wealthy, privileged classes. And there were many inns like this one. The visitors always kept an eye on the comings and goings of the women and on the potential trafficking of guns. This was the era of wars fought between the daimyo for the possession of land, and the serving girls were frequently used as informers. So they were always under suspicion. And rifles, which had just started to make their mark as effective battle weapons, were in constant demand. For this reason, everybody in the inn was kept under very careful surveillance. The samurai were essentially men of action, but their daily lives were punctuated by a few unchanging rituals, such as the tea ceremony. From the 13th century on, this ceremony was practiced in cultured circles together with calligraphy and flower arrangement, disciplines that also required concentration and composure. The tea ceremony was inspired by Zen teachings and has philosophical as well as social significance. Four basic Zen principles govern the ceremony. Harmony, respect, purity, and tranquility. Both body and mind are directed toward austerity and total consciousness, even in the simplest of gestures. The way of tea, or sado, reflects the very essence of the Japanese spirit. Reserved for the initiated, it was considered an extremely important tradition. Each object, each gesture, is a reminder of the fragility of everything in this world, and must be carefully chosen in accordance with its aesthetic quality. The objects used, the bowl, the tea canister, the cane, whisk, and spoon are all objets d'art. The preparatory gestures are carried out according to a strict disciplinary code, and inflexible rules define the conduct of the guests.
The ceremonial demands many years of practice. It takes place in a small room designed in simple materials evoking purity. Each aspect of the decor is part of a harmonious whole. Each gesture, each word is controlled, moderate and precise. The samurai, whose life was impregnated by a stoic indifference to material goods, held the tea ceremony in extremely high regard. The ritual was in keeping with their frugal lifestyle, and this, in addition to its aesthetic significance, was considered essential to spiritual progress. Accompanied by his courtiers, the shogun himself participated to discuss philosophy and religion and provide inspiration to the artists and poets. The other influence fundamental to the samurai culture was the martial arts. In the course of many violent and bloody encounters, the samurai developed a wide range of fighting techniques. Prior to the Edo period, the handling of weapons was taught for use in combat against the enemy. Later, Mudo was used as an educational tool, as it still is today. From the Edo period through to modern times, Mudo and education have remained closely associated and are virtually one and the same thing. In other words, the martial arts were used as a structure to shape and train model citizens. Iaido, or the Way of the Sword, originated in Japan in the 8th century. It is a heritage that has been assimilated into Japanese culture, a source of inner strength that has become almost a part of their genetic makeup. It was taught in a variety of forms in a range of schools up until the end of the 16th century, when it absorbed aspects of Zen teachings. From the 17th century on, the way of the sword was reserved exclusively for the samurai. Iaido was not intended to bring down the adversary. Technique is secondary to the spiritual elements of the discipline, as explained by Tadashi Fujita, vice president of the Iaido Federation of Tokyo. Iaido is the art of confronting the opponent's sword, but without striking him and without him striking you. Whether you deliver a hit or receive one, you are the loser in both cases. When one of the opponents returns his sword to his sheath, this indicates that he wants to abandon the combat. We say that he has put up his sword. These days, the sword is not used in aggression. So when one opponent puts up his sword, it signifies that the other opponent has won the duel. In Kendo, you have only one person facing you. On the other hand, in Iaido, there are several imaginary adversaries on all sides to deal with. For example, when you have two opponents, one in front and one behind, you must use your powers of concentration and your sixth sense to fend off each opponent in turn. To take on the enemy at your rear, the one in front must first be defeated 
but without foregoing the basic aim of the combat, which is, of course, to defeat both adversaries. The same principle applies when you have opponents on either side of you. The objective is to exert mental control over the maximum number of adversaries and defeat them all, one by one. Originally, the dojo was devoted to Buddhist rites. As time passed, it became the temple in which the way, the attainment of universal harmony, was taught. In Japan, the dojo is where the Zen spirit of the samurai is perpetuated. The martial arts are a continuing source of spiritual teaching. Its practitioners are guided by the principles of Budo, which for them represents a way of life. Kendo is the art of katana. It is a spectacular discipline that uses bamboo or leather swords manipulated with both hands. As in karate, in kendo, you cry out kiai, specifying the targeted part of the opponent's body. This discipline can be dangerous, and for this reason, those who take part wear suitable protective equipment. Kendo is now practiced throughout the world. It has been a source of inspiration in every creative field. The director of Star Wars, George Lucas, for example, adapted part of the Kendo costume for Darth Vader, who represents the dark side of the Force. In the same way as the martial arts, the Japanese garden is intended to inspire serenity. It is a space designed for contemplation and meditation. Inspired by Zen philosophy, these dry gardens of undulating sand, gravel, and blue-tinted rocks were installed alongside the Buddhist temples. Archery, or kyojutsu, was an essential element of the art of combat cultivated by the samurai. But the actual firing of the arrow was the end result of long inner preparation aimed at purifying the archer's mind. All who practice the martial arts, such as this expert in archery, are initiated into techniques of breathing, meditation, and concentration. In Japan, archery has been recognized as a martial art since before the Nara period. Kyujutsu, from which Kyudo is derived, incorporated a great many Chinese ideas and philosophies. Kyujutsu is a discipline that was originally practiced in two different ways. It was the basic technique of archery, but also a ritualized ceremony that was performed on special occasions in aristocratic circles. Nobody knows exactly when it originated, but we think it became established in either the 15th or mid-16th century. 
16世紀以降。ですから、弓というものが。Kyujutsu was practiced as a ceremony in the imperial court during the Nara, Heian, and Kamakura periods. Nowadays, this art is mainly practiced by students. Koei Iriye has been teaching Kyudo for most of his life. He sees archery as a mental rather than physical discipline, and one that requires intense concentration and perfect breath control. At examination time, it also helps his students to release their stress. From the Kamakura period in the 12th century, warriors combined the art of archery with that of horsemanship. The Kisha, the mounted archers, made their appearance at this time. These days, only a wealthy elite can enjoy this discipline, known as Yabusami. The riders gallop along a 200 meter track. And must hit three different targets. The Kisha must be both excellent horsemen and highly skilled archers. In this densely populated country, where space is limited, only the very wealthy can afford the luxury of horse riding. It is thus considered a privilege to practice Yabusami. Nowadays, Yabusami is a common event during the major Shinto ceremonies in which peace and prosperity are celebrated. The festivities commence with a dignified procession preceded by a priest on a white horse, a symbol of purity. The priest is followed by the participants dressed in traditional samurai costume. Kisha are extremely popular in Japan and are seen as the skilled descendants of the mythical samurai. The blood of the great warrior families flows in the veins of some of these men. Yabusami teacher, Yataka Kaneko, is one of them. According to the ancient texts and oral tradition, the Yabusame had to gallop a distance measuring between 217 and 250 meters. In former times, the archer's bow was used as the standard unit of measurement for the course. There was a span of 35 or 36 bow lengths between each target, which represented an overall distance of some 60 meters. And between the horse and the target, there had to be three to five bow lengths, a distance of between six and ten meters. And that's the way it's always been done. Due to Yataka Kaneko's reputation as a Yabusami master and his knowledge of samurai history, his services are frequently called upon by Japanese film directors. He has worked with some of Japan's greatest, including Kurosawa, who presented him with this storyboard from The Seven Samurai. I've worked in three of Kurosawa's movies, The Seven Samurai, The Spider's Castle, and The Hidden Fortress. This is the great actor Toshiro Mifune. After he finished filming The Seven Samurai, Mifune became my student. He came to me to learn to ride. The greater part of his training 
took place in Gotemba, at the foot of Mount Fuji. At that time, many of the film extras Kurosawa hired were well-trained horsemen. But the problem was that they were used to Western saddles, which produced a different effect to riding in a Japanese saddle, even if they were really good riders. And so Mr. Kurosawa had a great many problems with the extras when shooting his battle scenes. When they had to ride wearing armor, those who were riding in a western saddle, by far the majority of them, found it impossible to keep the same stance as those using the Japanese saddle. So this was a huge problem for Kurosawa. When my father took over as director of the Takeda School in 1965, he inherited a number of documents and historic objects, and so he decided to use them to set up a museum. When one of my ancestors gave his lands to the emperor, he was presented with this armor by way of thanks. This is where the emperor signed his name. This is his signature, Ogimashi, the emperor Ogimashi. This is what is called umayoroi. It's a horseman's armor made from hide. When Kyushu was overthrown during the Hideyoshi period, the samurai who served the local barons were very poor and couldn't afford armor. The opposing imperial troops were dressed in ceremonial regalia. They wore this armor in order to impress the samurai who had never set eyes on anything like this. This is called a barman. It's a mask that was placed on the horses' heads to make them look like ghosts. Whatever means possible were employed in order to terrorize the enemy. In the 11th century, the warriors began wearing the armor known as the oyoroye, made from long iron plates joined together and lined with leather. The traditional horned helmet, the hoshi kabuto, together with the bearskin covered armor, demonstrate the importance the samurai attached to their appearance. They also wore masks designed to protect them and put fear into their adversaries. The impression made on the enemy was all important and the psychological dimension of combat was vital to the warrior's strategy. Everything possible was done to intimidate and terrify the opponent. The samurai always wore makeup and perfume. This was their way of preparing themselves to confront death in battle. Their sole aim in life was to serve their master, an ideal reinforced by a code of honor. Thus Bushido envisaged voluntary death a samurai who failed would remove his armor, fall to his knees, and plunge his sword into his abdomen, cutting it open. In former times, this ceremony, known as seppuku, or harakiri, was the only way to die a hero's death. In modern Japan, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of men who want a taste of this heroic past. And so, they don the armor of their ancestors. Despite its appearance, the suit was designed to be put on rapidly and weighs no more than 10 kilograms. The armor's metallic sections fit each part of the body. The plates are held together by lanyards in the colors of the clan to which the warrior belongs. These flexible suits of armor enabled ample freedom of movement. 
The material used and its appearance changed according to the type of combat, whether hand-to-hand -hand or using swords, firearms, or bows. The samurai carried two swords slung on the belt, the long sword, or katana, and the short sword, or wakizashi. These dedicated enthusiasts of ancient history meet together once a year at Soma, on the island of Honshu. They will know by heart the combat techniques used to neutralize the adversary that have been passed down from generation to generation disrupt the opponent's rhythm, divert his attention, and keep the sun behind you or to your right. The participants are expected to embody the values of their heroes, a clear and accurate understanding of courage, an audacious spirit, and self-control. Today, the samurai are generally seen as sacred figures. This is because they drew from the different religions the principles that would strengthen their spirit. From Buddhism, they took confidence in their destiny and the acceptation of death. From Shintoism, the masculine qualities of loyalty and bravery, indispensable on the field of battle. The participants are here on this former battlefield to race rather than fight each other. The streaming banners recall the loyalties of these military retainers, men totally devoted to their masters. Horsemen are in an almost trance-like state as they gallop along the course in an attempt to recapture their forebears' sense of bravado. In this contest, the aim is not to win. It is to rekindle the ancient spirit of the samurai warrior. In the excessively modernized urban Japan of today, the younger generation are not particularly interested in the traditional values of chivalry. In the Japan of today, the martial arts are mostly used to produce ideal citizens. The martial arts obey very different philosophical laws to those of the sports that have been imported from the West. One thing is clear, Budo was not designed as an amusing pastime. Children, for example, find the discipline attached to the martial arts far too strict and have difficulty in conforming to it. So quite obviously, they prefer sports such as football, basketball and baseball, which are far more amusing and much more spectacular. And so most of today's youngsters tend to steer away from the martial arts. Budo is no longer a popular activity in Japan, and the martial arts in general are on the decline. 
Disciplines such as judo and karate are much more likely to be practiced by Westerners than by the Japanese. In an attempt to stem this decline, a well-known businessman, Tetsundo Tanabe, has decided to innovate. He is passionately interested in his country's history, using his private fortune to seek out and buy up lost works of art and bring them back to Japan. In order to keep the flame of Japanese culture burning, he decided to create a new discipline based on the martial arts. I've always had a great interest in the martial arts. The dojo in which I initially trained practiced a range of traditional martial arts such as kendo, archery and javelin throwing, which all date back to the Meiji period. They taught a wide range of different disciplines there. I practiced various types of iaido while I was there too. And I also trained with an authentic battle sword, like this one here. Because I was really taken by the martial arts, I asked myself how I could pass on this facet of traditional Japanese culture to the rest of the world. And so I invented a new sport and called it Shambhala. Although it's a simulated form of combat, it is practiced in total safety. Shambhala has three main advantages. It's a sport that can be played by people of any age, it's not at all aggressive, and last but not least, its rules are much more liberal. This is an inflatable rubber sword. It is pliable and gives way when making a hit, so it's not at all dangerous. And it makes a fantastic sound as it hits. That's Shambara, a universal sport. Our slogan is Shambara, the sport of the samurai. You put the cap back on, and here we have a katana. When it hits its target, it gives way. It's totally safe. Although still in its early stages, Shambara is enjoying tremendous success. This new sport is mainly practiced by children who see it more as a fun game, much less encumbered by all the rigid rules applied to traditional martial arts. The rules are simple enough for children to enjoy it from day one. They're spared the unrewarding early stages required to learn many of the other martial disciplines. Style of dress is optional, but certain protective equipment is necessary. As is often the practice, children and adults of different levels train together. The most experienced use two swords, in keeping with authentic samurai tradition. The notion of game playing is all important. The dojo in which Shambara is practiced is different to the traditionally silent dojo and its atmosphere of intense concentration, far too oppressive for the youngsters. Putting these modern and realistic principles to work by creating the new sport of Shambara, Tetsundo Tanabe has taken many risks. Children behave quite naturally. 
It's great to see them enjoying themselves in such a way. It helps them to let off steam. It is perhaps through Shambhara that this youngster will eventually discover the martial traditions. And when he does, he will be able to draw strength from the ancient Japanese traditions in which his culture is rooted. He will gain an understanding of the way of the warriors, those faithful vassals who sought wisdom through combat and practiced a way of life that offered death with honor. There were men whose noble bearing and steadfast gaze unmistakably identified them as samurai.